Hello folks and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be kind of a long one because we are talking about becoming a body piercer. Of all the questions I get asked online, of all the questions I get asked on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram, what I get asked the most often is how to become a body piercer. So let's talk about it today. To start, the path into becoming a piercer, but especially a good piercer, is an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship is a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or three training and mentorship program wherein someone who is interested in learning a trade or a craft shadows and works alongside and beneath a master or an experienced person in that craft. Apprenticeships are really easily recognizable because they are typically done on the job. So whoever is training, whoever the apprentice is, is going with their mentor, watching them work, working alongside them in actual work situations. And apprenticeships don't just apply to piercing and tattooing. There are apprenticeships for electrical, plumbing, HVAC, tons of different types of apprenticeships that happen across the America. There's even national apprenticeship registries. And apprenticing can be a really effective, really strong teaching tool for many trades, especially trades that function more hands-on. So if you're interested in becoming a body piercer, an apprenticeship is the route that you're going to want to go. Now a typical apprenticeship for body piercing takes about two to four years, during which time the apprentice starts off learning not hands-on, but just like some book learning, learning things about jewelry materials, skin prep, sterilization, cleanliness, disinfection, things like how the studio runs, handling inventory, orders, client interactions, bedside manner, taking phone calls, answering messages, helping clients, and then things that will relate to piercing in the future. You start learning anatomy, different piercing placements, jewelry limitations, all that sort of stuff. Eventually that progresses on to starting to get a little hands-on. Most apprentices start by doing jewelry changes and just getting a feel for how it is to work on piercings and work on bodies. And then once they have all this foundational knowledge and understanding, they move on to applying the knowledge that they've gained towards actually performing piercings and mastering the techniques necessary to do those piercings correctly. And this is not a very fast process. Like I said, the average apprenticeship can take anywhere from two to four years. And a lot of studios have an apprentice work for anywhere from six months to a year or two as front of house first before apprenticing in order to make sure that they're going to be a good fit and also to give them time to get a lot of foundational knowledge about jewelry, about how the studio operates and runs, and about background knowledge before they start on their apprenticeship. So this can be a very lengthy process. Aside from the fact that apprenticeships can take a long time, studios typically only have enough space for one or two apprentices at once. Any more than that, honestly, even two apprentices it seems like a lot. I, I personally could not have more than one apprentice at once. Just because I don't think I could give more than one person the attention and training and level of detail that they would deserve out of an apprenticeship at once. So it is also limiting how many apprentices a studio can manage at once. Aside from that, here in America, we do have laws protecting the rights of apprentices. The Fitzgerald Act is the most notable among them, and this requires apprentices to be paid at minimum, minimum wage in their area. Now, me personally, I believe that an apprentice should be paid a living wage, whatever that looks like for the area you're in. But regardless, if you're getting an apprenticeship, you legally need to be paid. You should not be working for free. You should not be working unpaid. And unless it's an incredibly specific nationally accredited program, you should not be paying to be an apprentice. And fun fact, there are no nationally recognized and accredited programs that meet the requirements for a paid apprenticeship for tattooing or body piercing in America. This information is easily accessible online, and if you'd like to hear me talk more about pay wages and legality for apprentices, I'm going to link that video here. I have one all about it here on my channel, but yes, you do need to be paid as an apprentice in America. And outside of all of that, apprenticeships are also a really big investment for the mentor. If a mentor has an apprentice and is taking time to teach the apprentice things, show the apprentice things, have the apprentice watching them and observing them a lot, it actually slows the mentor down. We're working slower in order to give our apprentice opportunities to see what's going on and learning. We're spending more time explaining contact with our apprentices. And this means that we have less time to take clients some days. And this means that we make less money. So having an apprentice in a studio is an incredible time commitment. It's an incredible financial commitment because we're paying our apprentices living wages. We're giving them health insurance. We're making sure that people are taken care of in their apprenticeships. 
and it's also a financial investment because the mentor is not able to do as many piercing services or make as much money. That time is now being spent on educating and training their apprentice. All of these things mean that there are a finite number of apprenticeship slots at good studios available at any given time. And despite the fact that there's this finite number, there's thousands and thousands of people vying for these few spots. I like to compare it to playing pro sports or wanting to play for the NHL. There's only so many teams and there's only so many positions, but there's hundreds of thousands of high school football teams and athletes and folks who have been practicing and dreaming of making it in this career their whole lives, but there's only a couple hundred spots available. And this makes things very competitive. So now that we've talked briefly about the formatting of apprenticeships, how they work, and also what type of investment it is on the studio to have an apprentice, let's talk about what it takes to actually get an apprenticeship. Now, like I mentioned, there's only so many positions available at any given time for an apprenticeship at a good studio, but there's dozens of applicants. That means that unfortunately, only one person is gonna get chosen to get the chance to apprentice and learn. So how do you make yourself stand out and become that person that a studio wants to work with? And the biggest way that you can do this is by becoming a good client. Now, what does a good client look like? Obviously, when you first hear becoming a good client, what pops into your mind is going to a studio and getting a lot of piercings and getting a lot of work done. And that is one path to becoming a good client. Um, but I would actually suggest going about things a little differently if you are capable of doing so. If you're interested in becoming a body piercer, I would a, definitely suggest getting some piercings first, making sure you enjoy the process of being pierced, seeing what it's like from the client's perspective, making sure this is a good fit for you, all of those things. Now, a lot of folks will find one studio they like and stick to it and always go there, and that definitely will help you build a really great rapport with that singular studio, but that studio may not be looking for an apprentice, they may already have one, they may not be ready to take one on, also, while you may really enjoy the experience of getting pierced there, there is a whole lot more piercing out there. Most studios operate very differently from one another. They have different mentalities and mindsets behind piercing, behind how to run a studio, and each studio has kind of its own charm, its own essence. So what I suggest doing is researching studios in your area, finding out what studios are safe, what studios are quality, and then taking some time to get pierced at different places see what the experience is like at each studio. Think about the things that you really enjoyed. Think about the things that you really didn't enjoy. Ask yourself about the ways each piercer and each studio work and pierce. Are the studios focused on super high-end gold and gemstones and diamonds? Is it a really luxury experience? Do you enjoy what that luxury experience entails? Is a studio more casual? Is it more focused on simple titanium and basics? Does it have more of a street shop vibe where things are very relaxed? Do you enjoy that environment more than a fancier luxury environment or vice versa? This gives you time to really feel out different studios, feel out different methods of piercing and see what you as a client enjoy, but also gives you time to visualize what direction you would like to head in as a body piercer. And this gives you an idea of which studios you want to focus your interest on when it comes to getting an apprenticeship. For me, when I really started taking piercing seriously, I was living in the Philadelphia area and I got pierced at five different really awesome quality studios all over Philly in the time span of about six or seven months. Now, obviously I didn't want to get a bunch of piercings, so I was getting a lot of little simple stuff like earlobes and things like that just to really feel out the studios. And of those five, three really stood out to me. Two, I did have, you know, totally fine experiences at. I wouldn't say that I had bad experiences, but when I thought about the type of piercer that I wanted to be and what I wanted out of becoming a body piercer, those two studios just didn't really fit the vibe and the energy that I was going for. The other three, however, definitely did, and it gave me a feel for the type of piercing that I was really interested in. For example, the two studios that I had went to that I didn't really vibe with were not full service studios. They didn't offer a lot of more advanced piercing work or a lot of genital piercing work. And I realized very early on that these were elements of piercing that I was really passionate and interested in. So the three studios that I was interested in were studios that were full service, where if I did get the chance to apprentice there, I could learn how to do genital piercings, I could learn how to do more advanced and complicated piercings, services and that was really more up my alley and more of the experience I was looking for as a client but also to provide as a body piercer. 
Now, once you've figured out some studios in your area that offer good quality safe piercing, and once you've figured out the style of piercing that you want to offer, then I think it's worth it to approach the studios and begin expressing your interest in getting into the industry. Please, please, for the love of everything, when you are doing this, do not cold call. Cold calling means contacting, well, technically cold calling means calling someone up on the phone out of the blue that you've never had an interaction with and talking to them. But in this context, it means like contacting a studio that you have no interaction with, that you've never visited as a client, that you've never talked to, uh, and asking them to teach you. It's considered super disrespectful in the industry. And for those who are wondering why that's considered super disrespectful, backtrack and think about how much work it is for a studio to have an apprentice and then to have random people who have never met, who never come into the studio, who've never even taken the time to see how we work or how we do things, just say, oh yeah, I want you to teach me how to pierce. Well, why? You've never met me. You don't know how I work. You don't know how my studio works and operates. I think you just want anyone to teach you how to pierce, not me to teach you how to pierce. And also, quite frankly, I can promise you that studio has people who are clients, who are regulars, who are coming into the studio, who are patroning the studio, who are talking to the piercers, supporting them online, showing their interest, who are also hoping to get an apprenticeship. And cold calling is just going to set you off on the wrong foot. Now, when I mention this, a lot of folks immediately go, well, Lynn, what if I can't go into these studios in person? What if I live in an area where there's no good reputable piercers or no one good to learn for? What do I do then? And in this instance, I would suggest doing some research on where the nearest reputable piercers to you are and planning a day trip to go and travel and go to their studios and see them, see how they run, same thing. But just like people go and visit colleges and interview at colleges to figure out where they want to go, just like folks travel for work interviews to see if they want to relocate and work somewhere, you've got to get into studios and see if they would be a good fit for you before you decide that you want to do your apprenticeship there. And that's as much for your benefit as it is for the studio's benefit because yes, for the studio, they're almost always going to pick an apprentice that they've had contact and communication with that they know that they like, but also for the apprentice, you don't want to say, oh, this studio is hiring. I'm just going to go there and accept the job right off the bat, show up and find out that you are not learning the type of piercing or the style of tattooing or whatever the case may be that you want to learn. It's really important that an apprenticeship is a good fit for both the mentor and the apprentice. This means that the apprentice is being taught in ways that work for them about the type of piercing that they want to do and you have to do a little bit of legwork and research to get to that point. Now when we talk about being a good client for a studio being a really great way to get your way into an apprenticeship I want to clarify that being a good client does not mean spending money. Now it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that if you have money to spend that is going to give you a leg up but the only leg up that having money to spend should give someone is the ability to travel to more studios, see more piercers, and experience more different techniques around piercing in order to give them a better picture of what type of piercing they want to do in the long run and get them more experience as a client, more piercings, and kind of more of a feel of what piercing is going to be like. If someone comes in as a client and they drop a thousand dollars every time that they're in a studio, that should not give them an advantage over the clients who can only pay 50 or $60 when they come in the studio. And I will acknowledge that that is a problem in the industry. There is a lot of inherent classism and I do see studios who give heavy bias towards clients who spend a lot. It's unfortunate that that's the reality, but we should acknowledge that that is the reality for a lot of places. So that way we can try and work on improving that issue. But fortunately, I would say that that's few and far between. And when I see a lot of good studios and reputable piercers take on apprentices, a lot of them are not looking at money in that sense. They are looking at being a good client. And yes, being a good client does mean coming in and getting pierced. But being a good client can also mean coming in and getting checkups on your piercings while they're still healing, which are often free at many studios taking that extra time to drop in, make sure your piercing's looking good and healing well, taking that time to talk with your piercer and interact, build up that rapport with the studio, and continue letting your interest be known. Being a good client also looks like interacting with piercers and studios online, commenting on their social media posts, messaging them when you see them post a piercing that's cool that you have questions about, or if you have questions about different things. It looks like coming back in so your piercer can get healed photos of your piercing that they did. 
it looks like if they have a guest artist coming out to the studio coming out even if you're not going to get pierced by the guest artist just to meet them and talk with them about their experience guesting their experience as a piercer etc if it's not reasonable for you to travel to a studio in person that often a lot of this can be done virtually do more virtual checkups with your piercer send them pictures of how your piercing is healing ask for feedback again respond to posts on social media message them when you have questions I will say this, I see a lot of clients who turn to online forums and like TikTok and things like that when they have questions about piercings and get their answers there. And if you are interested in becoming a piercer, by doing that, you are really missing out on a lot of really great interaction with your piercer that could be building the type of relationship that makes you a good client and makes you someone who's more likely to be a candidate. Remember, your piercer is there to help you with all of these things. You could definitely ask, the internet what they think about this color opal with your setup or what advice they have for your bump but you could also ask your piercer that same thing and have more interactions with them and build that relationship I think Gray is a really great example of this. They are Piercings by Gray on Instagram. They are the current apprentice at Icon Tattoo and Body Piercing. And I actually relocated them to Icon in Nashville from South Florida to come an apprentice at Icon under Ian Bishop and partially under myself. Now, Gray was my client in Florida long before they were ever working in the industry or doing anything piercing related. And they were a client who did not have the budget to spend on a ton of stuff. They were working with a really limited budget, <laughs> with really limited finances. They would come in and get piercings and it would always be basic jewelry and it would be simple stuff. But what really stood out to me about Gray is that every time they came in, they had really awesome questions that showed me that they really were taking things seriously with their piercings. And they came to me with those questions with consistency. When they had questions about stretching their piercings and issues they were having with existing piercings, they were the first to message me, to email me, to reach out and talk to me about that. When they came into the studio, they always took extra time to comment on projects they'd seen me post on Instagram that they thought were really cool, or ask questions about stuff that they'd seen online that they weren't sure about. Rather than tagging their favorite creator or asking about it in a random forum, they came and talked to me about this stuff, and it allowed me to build a relationship with them, but also see how much clear passion they had for piercing and for this industry. When they had time, they would walk down to the studio from their job and just be like, hey, could you just like take a quick peek and see how things are healing? Or I know you wanted to get healed photos of this. Or they'd come by just to see new jewelry collections that got dropped and things in the case. Their passion was so incredibly clear and evident from the way that they interacted in piercings, how much knowledge they were hungry for, the fact that they would message me at four in the morning about a piercing that they never wanted had or had any plans to get but they were just so curious about it I could tell that they had this overwhelming passion for it so when it came time to fill that apprenticeship position there there were a bunch of great candidates who were Nashville local who were native to icon there was one candidate who was someone who was a very big spender at icon who bought a lot of fancy gold jewelry and things like that but these were also people who basically just came in one time and were like, yeah, I really want to be a piercer. Like, I think that'd be really cool. And then that was it. That was the whole interaction. They never followed up on it. They never interacted about it. They never showed that passion for it. So when we were looking at the field of people that we could hire from and pick for this, Gray was a no brainer. They were someone who was so passionate, who was so motivated, who was so clear for. And even when I had left Florida and relocated to Nashville, they were still commenting on my stuff. They were still commenting on Icon stuff. They followed the new studio on social media. They still messaged and asked good questions. Like it was so evident that they were truly passionate about that. And when you compare someone who's having interactions like that with the studio to, I have had people message me who don't follow me and don't follow the studio, just message me and go, I wanna be a piercer. I think piercing's really cool. Would you take me on as an apprentice? It's a no brainer who is going to stand out. Now, obviously just saying things like show you're passionate, show you're motivated, be a good client. These can be abstract things that can be hard to understand. Like how am I supposed to show my passion? So I'd like to get into some specific examples of things that you can do that make you a great apprenticeship candidate. 
Before we get into that though, I wanna to touch on something that comes up every single time I talk about apprenticeships. That's people who I think have a little bit of entitlement when it comes into apprenticeships, who will listen to piercers or tattoo artists or any field really, talk about the competitive nature of getting one of these slots and will say things like, it shouldn't have to be so competitive, everyone should be able to have the opportunity to apprentice, etc., etc. And yes, in an ideal world, do I think it would be great if everyone who had a passion or an interest in a certain career or a certain path was able to take that career and take that path? Absolutely. But there is no industry, there is no job market, there's no school where it is not a little competitive. And this is why I really like to liken this to playing in professional sports, because there are only so many positions available, but there are hundreds of thousands of people interested in those positions. Same thing with colleges. Colleges only have room for so many students, even if they get millions of applications. Same thing for any job position. One really coveted, really awesome position at a job open and 40 applicants and someone's got to get chosen. And we're not just going to pick at random. We're not just going to draw names out of a hat. We're going to pick the most qualified candidate for the position, for the opening, for the team or for the apprenticeship. And that is how it goes in every field. That is how it goes for me as a piercer applying to work at a different studio. That studio is going to get applications from a dozen different piercers. I need to show them why I am the piercer that they want to hire, why I have skill sets that are going to benefit their business. Yes, getting a good apprenticeship is very competitive, but I think that's just kind of the nature of any job market um, or any educational program. And you do need to work hard to set yourself apart. Now, this does not mean that I think that the apprenticeship system is perfect, and at the end of this video, we're gonna talk about flaws in apprenticing uh, and a lot of beef that I have with apprenticeship structure, so stay tuned for that. Now, when it comes to concrete things that you can do that I think really showcase a passion for piercing or really make someone stand out as an apprenticeship candidate, there's quite a few. One of the biggest ones, I, no lie here, work retail. Work retail. I love hiring on people who have worked at Starbucks, who've worked at Target and Walmart, who've worked at grocery stores, who've worked at restaurants, any retail, any customer facing job that is going to prepare you so much for what we do in the studio, because we are our own form of retail service. We are dealing with the general population. We're dealing with customers and we're dealing with all of the headaches that come along with retail. And so that is going to give you great experience for what it is like working in a studio. Restaurants and food service especially, it's high stress, you get super slammed sometimes, there's always stuff going on, there's always stuff to keep up with. That is great prep for being in the potty piercing industry. Honestly, most folks who are working in restaurants or working in a busy Starbucks have it way harder than we do as body piercers. So hats off to y'all for managing that. But there is a lot of overlap between body piercing and retail. And I love seeing retail on someone's resume when they're applying for the studio or trying to get an apprenticeship because they know that it means that they have some experience that's going to translate really well to working in a studio. Now, obviously, one of the main differences between working retail and working in a studio is that we are dealing with human bodies and blood. And that means a really great way to prepare yourself for becoming an apprentice is to already have CPR training, first aid training and bloodborne pathogens training. CPR and first aid training need to be done in person first, but most high schools, colleges, and even local churches and community outreach centers offer these classes, oftentimes for free or very reduced rates if you're looking through programs in your community. The Red Cross is all over America and hosts amazing CPR and first aid training programs that you can get done, and I would strongly encourage anyone who's interested in becoming an apprenticeship to go through those programs and have those certifications ready. For bloodborne pathogens, the Association of Professional Piercers has a fantastic bloodborne pathogens program that's specific to our industry that can be accessed on their website, safepiercing.org, and that is the bloodborne pathogens class that I suggest anyone who's in the industry or interested in being in the industry take. Having these certifications already helps a ton, and it definitely shows me that you know the type of career field you're getting in and you're serious enough to have already done that first. Now, another great way to show your passion is to be passionate about all forms of body piercing. Now, obviously, until you're in an apprenticeship, you're not going to be learning about the techniques to actually do the piercing, but there is so much about piercing that you can learn before you become an apprentice. I have a body piercing and body modification media list on my website that has a collection of my favorite books, 
movies, podcasts, channels, all sorts of resources about safe body piercing, about body piercing history, the cultures it comes from, information about metal and jewelry safety and efficacy, information about how the modern piercing industry came to be what it is today. That's all good stuff to read and research and learn about. And then that gives you more of an ability to connect with your piercer if you're interested in getting into piercing. Using Gray as an example again, they were making their passion very known and very clear. They actually asked me if they could borrow my copy of Running the Gauntlet, uh, and they did. They actually still have it. Give that back. It's been literally years. Um, <laughs> and came, read home, read it, and then came back into the studio and messaged me and talked with me about what they were reading in that book. And that was such a great way that didn't involve coming into the studio, getting pierced, spending money, for them to interact with me about piercing, for them to learn a bunch of really cool stuff about body piercing history, and for them to build that good client relationship with me. And that's something that you could do with anyone. If you lived in an area where there is very little access Access to safe piercing and your nearest safe piercer is hours away, obviously it's not realistic for you to pop into the studio all the time. But message that piercer and ask them their favorite media relates to piercing. Do they have a YouTube channel that they love? Do they have books that resonate with them? Do they have movies that inspired them to pierce? Ask them that and then consume that media. Watch those movies, read those books, and then talk with them about what you're reading and what you're learning. That is such a fantastic way that costs very little to nothing at all. Some of these things are free online. Some of these books and movies are free online for someone to start building that relationship with a piercer that they're interested in learning from. Another really big thing that you can do to show your passion, show your interest is to build related skill sets because piercers are so much more than just piercers. We are photographers who have to take great pictures of our work for social media. We're jewelry and gemstone experts with knowledge from the Gemological Institute of America and jewelry manufacturing about the gems and the stones that we sell. We're artists with a really strong understanding of composition and color theory to create beautiful ear curations and things that flow with the ear. We're businessmen and we're tax professionals who have to pay our taxes every year, balance a budget for a business, pay for supplies, and understand all the things that go into that. We have to be social media experts who are constantly advertising ourselves in our studio online, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook, figuring out ways to make new connections with clients and using social media to grow our business. Any of these skill sets that you can grow outside of your apprenticeship or before you get your apprenticeship can make someone a really appealing candidate for a studio. When I was trying to find my final apprenticeship, I was an art major in college uh, and in high school at the time, and I tried to really pitch that as one of my strong suits. And actually, as part of two of my interviews, I brought my camera with me and offered to take photos of jewelry that they had in the studio on the spot. I took them home and edited them and sent them back over to the studio as examples of content that I could create for social media. And that was actually what landed me my second apprenticeship. The owner at the time had multiple different applications, but she was really impressed by the photographic work that I produced, by the fact that I took the initiative to do that, and that I was marketing myself as, hey, I can do the same job that everyone else who's applying can do for front of house for you at your studio, but I also have these photography skills and I can be a real asset to you for your social media and advertising because I have these skills. And that was what set me apart and made me stand out amongst the other applications. And she went, wow, it would be super useful to have someone do my photography and my social media posts. I think Lynn is the person I'm going to go with. Just some examples of things that you can do that I think really make an apprenticeship candidate stand out to a studio. Like someone much more likely is being chosen for an apprenticeship role in a studio. Before you, this video is long, so let's circle back around and talk about a couple other things that are really important when it comes to apprenticing. Obviously, we spent a lot of this video talking about what a good, stable apprenticeship looks like and how to get one, but the response that I'll get from a lot of folks is, well, it's really hard to get a good apprenticeship, there's not a lot of good studios around me, or they're not hiring currently, but there's some crappy studios around me hiring. Could I just go and work there to get my foot in the door and go from there? Uh, and no surprise, uh, I really wouldn't suggest that. And that is coming from personal experience as someone who did have a very bad apprenticeship. My first apprenticeship was bad. Uh, and it cost me so much more to have a bad apprenticeship and be taught bad things and have to unlearn those bad things and get basically a brand new apprenticeship because I had been taught so incorrectly. 
And I see so many people who go this route who think, oh, I'll just get whatever apprenticeship I can get, whatever's offered to me just to get their my foot in the door. And then those people turn around once they're working as piercers four or five years later and they're going to conference, they're in these educational spaces and they're going, I don't know how to pierce an ear the right way. I don't know how to sterilize jewelry the right way. I don't even know how to work with high quality safe body jewelry. And it is a mountain of unlearning that you have to do. Not to mention that when you choose to settle for an apprenticeship that you know is lesser than or not great, just to get your foot in the door and get your professional career ahead, you are putting your profession and your career directly on your clients' bodies. And you're saying, I'm willing to be taught incorrectly, I'm willing to be taught unsafely, and I'm willing to do incorrect and unsafe work to my clients if it means I get ahead in my career. And that is not something that a good piercer does. For me, I didn't know any better when I got my first apprenticeship and that is solely on me. I thought I was going to a great studio. I thought I knew what was what. I didn't take the time to really do research. To No, that was on me. That was on me for not understanding what I was getting myself into, not getting the education. But very quickly in working there, I started learning more about safe piercing and more about what that looked like. And I realized how wrong I was doing things and how wrong I'd been taught. I ended up quitting and having to find a new apprenticeship. And if having to unlearn everything and restart from the beginning and all of that work is not enough, let me tell you from personal experience the guilt that you will live with uh, if you knowingly take on a bad apprenticeship and do bad piercings uh, will haunt you for the rest of your career. And even with as far as I've come in my career and even with the level of work that I do now, I still feel incredibly bad when I think back on some of the piercings that I did in that first apprenticeship, even though I was taught to do them that way and in some way it wasn't completely my fault it was still partially my fault and I still hurt people doing that uh, and that is not not a great feeling now I cannot in good faith talk about apprenticeships without touching on some of the issues with the system of apprenticing uh, obviously this is a very limiting system and there's lots of flaws with apprenticeships when I talk about getting into the industry, I will often have a lot of folks who tell me apprenticeships are not accessible and that shouldn't be the only way we get into the industry. Uh, and while I agree, a lot of those folks immediately turn to people should be allowed to learn how to pierce themselves at home or they should be allowed to do what they want or things like that. And I don't necessarily think that that's the right response to this either. Um, I do think that apprenticeships are a flawed system. I think there's lots of issues with pay equality. There's lots of issues with ethical labor and obviously lots and lots of issues with with racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia in apprenticeships. However, I do not think the answer is to learn how to do this stuff at home because you could say the exact same thing about basically the training required to get into any field. Uh, med school is a really great example of this. I think we can all acknowledge that the college education system in America is not great. And med school especially is incredibly flawed from the classism behind how much it costs to go to school and what it takes to get into the school to inherent racism, sexism, and homophobia when it comes to accepting student applications and getting residencies. There's a lot of problems with that system. However, that doesn't mean that we should normalize uh, watching some YouTube videos on brain surgery and deciding to learn how to become a brain surgeon in your garage. I think it would be far better for us to overhaul the system of apprenticing and try and fix a lot of the flaws and issues that it has rather than tell people to turn to learning how to do it themselves at home. When it comes to working with people's bodies and especially with blood and bloodborne pathogens, there's so much risk of actual grievous bodily harm that these things need to be learned in the proper way from educated teachers, instructors, and mentors and hands-on in person because you simply cannot learn a lot of this from watching a video or reading a textbook or listening to a podcast. And anything that we're doing that's working with blood and bodily fluids and putting us at risk of spreading bloodborne pathogens and bloodborne diseases and any line of work where we can cause really grievous bodily harm to someone through what we're doing because we're working on their bodies, that needs to be taken seriously and needs to be taught correctly. You want to learn how to do some woodworking at home and watch some videos, awesome, go for it. You wanna learn how to sew at home and make your own clothes, I think that's a great idea. You wanna learn how to fill cavities or do body piercings or do surgery, I think you need to learn that in a structured, safe environment. 
Now that being said, acknowledging it doesn't even begin to start the work of fixing those problems with apprenticeships, but there is a lot that we can do. Personally, my current focus is to try and get more studios to offer paid apprenticeships. One of the biggest areas where I think we see inequality and problems with apprenticeships is the fact that a lot of apprenticeships are still unpaid, meaning that people are expected to work five, six, sometimes seven days a week for no money and no wages. And this makes apprenticing incredibly inaccessible because only people who already have the financial means to pay their bills some other way or already have the ability to work two full-time jobs are able to access apprenticeships. And anyone who can't afford that or physically isn't able to work literally like 90 hours a week aren't able to access apprenticing and getting into the industry. And I don't think that's fair. I think one of the biggest changes we in an industry can do to improve the system of apprenticeships is to normalize and regulate paid apprenticeships and make sure that apprentices are paid a living wage. That way, people can afford to pay their bills, to live their life, to do the things they need to do, while also being able to be an apprentice and get into this industry that they're passionate about. And no one has to work extreme or unreasonable hours and put all that strain and stress on their body just to get a job as a body piercer. And I say this as someone who worked an unpaid apprenticeship. I worked seven days a week, 12 hours a day for multiple years. Uh, I worked two jobs for quite a while. I was working night shift three to four days a week and apprenticing during the day. There were many days where I slept for about three hours between jobs, um, slept in my car, slept at the studio, did whatever I could just to get some sleep in to do the work. Uh, and it's not fair. And other people should not have to go through that same thing. I also cannot talk about apprenticeships without touching on abuse in apprenticeships. There is a very serious issue with abuse, specifically sexual abuse and sexual violence in body piercing apprenticeships. The targets are primarily women and femmes, but can be anyone who's becoming an apprentice. And for far too long, the industry has kind of swept that under the rug and been very silent about it. If you'd like to see me do a whole video covering abuse in apprenticeships, uh, how this happens and kind of what we can do to try and change it. I would love to do that. In the meantime, I do have some blog posts that address this issue that I'm going to link down below. I feel like I could make another whole like 20 minute video uh, about the flaws in the apprenticeship system, uh, but that was not the point of this video. The point of this video is to talk about getting an apprenticeship, getting into the industry and becoming a body piercer. So I only wanted to touch on those subjects briefly, but if you'd like to see me do a deep dive uh, on everything I hate about apprenticeships and why I think the system needs an overhaul, let me know in the comments down below. If you are very seriously interested in becoming a body piercer, I have a ton of resources on my website for aspiring apprentices with information about how to get apprenticeships, how to stay safe in apprenticeships, and warnings about abuse and issues with apprenticing systems. I'm going to link a bunch of those blog posts down below and I would strongly suggest giving them a read if this is something you're serious about. Piercing is an absolutely beautiful industry that I am incredibly grateful to be a part of, and I am so excited for the next generation of piercers. Just from what I've seen about the folks who are just getting into the industry or looking to get into the industry, I know that we have some amazingly talented, motivated, wonderful people who are going to be in the industry in the next couple of years, and I can't wait to see the positive changes that y'all make. If you like this video and you'd like to see me talk more about apprenticeships or getting into the industry or you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments down below. And as per usual, if you like my content, please hit like and subscribe and I'm sure we'll be hanging out and chatting again soon. Bye!